Today, the title of the message is Caught Up. So if you have your Bibles open, let's pick it up in verse 13. It says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. What's going on here in in this letter to the Thessalonians is that the Christians there were sad because some of the believers in the church had died and Jesus hadn't returned yet to set up the kingdom of God. Now, they were expecting the Lord to return soon. And so when some folks in the fellowship died before Jesus returned, they felt like that they were gonna miss out on living with Jesus in his reign. And so they were sad, and Paul says, because of their ignorance of the plan of God. And, and that's okay, because they were new believers, right? They Remember, Paul had only stayed there for three weeks, and these were young Christians. And so Paul now explains to them some things that are important to know. In verse 13, he says, uh, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, I think that's important for us to know, that God doesn't want his children to be ignorant. Now, I think about, I'm a parent. I have three boys. They're adults now. Uh, they're in their late 20s, 30s, and uh, my kids growing up, I never thought, I want you to be the dumbest kid in the class. <laughs> I, mean, like, I never thought that, right? And so uh, I wanted them to know everything they needed to learn. And it, what Paul's saying is, you need to not be ignorant about what's coming in the future and about death and life after death and all these things that he's going to talk about. Now, if a person dies with not knowing Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that is a sad situation. But Jesus said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So we know that. And then Jesus said in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So Jesus is saying, look, there is life after death through him. And those who believe have that hope of eternal life, and that's a great thing. And what Jesus is saying is those who do not believe do not have that hope of eternal life. And it makes a big difference in how a person lives their life, and how you look at the future when you recognize that there is life after death, that this life is not everything. For the person who thinks this life is everything, well, it kind of can be depressing, right? Because imagine if you saved your whole life and worked and worked, and then the government decided to give your money to somebody else, (laughs) right? Now, if that was your hope, well, not so good. But but when we think about God's plan, uh, when a person dies, without believing in Jesus Christ, then, then there's sorrow, right? Because that means they choose to reject that hope of eternal life, the hope of resurrection. But a person who is a Christian who in Christ dies, then there is sorrow, and we do a lot of funerals here at church, but it's not as those who have no hope, right? In other words, that our sorrow is different because our sorrow is that we're going to miss those people who, who passed on, right? Uh, but but there is joy knowing that we're going to see them again one day, right? And so there is that joy, and there is sorrow, but it's a different kind of sorrow. And so uh, when we think about where they're at, so my dad passed away last year, and, you know, at his service, we, you know, celebrated all the great things we got to do together, and he's a believer. And so in my life, I was rejoicing that I'm going to see him again one day. That's great. He's saved. Your future is bright, right? When you think about God's plan is that whatever happens, right? If you die, you're going to go be with the Lord in heaven. Now, uh, it, it's a better place. So when he, he, Paul's talking to him about these things, about life after death, because I think everybody thinks about that. And, and, you know, in America, we've had strange ideas about soul sleep, all those sort of things. But Paul says in verse 13, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. That's speaking about those who, who died, because we know that physically they're dead, but their spirit lives on. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. He's talking about people who don't have that hope in Christ, and so that's a different kind of sorrow. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Now, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead gives us great hope because Jesus conquered death. We celebrated Easter, right, and just all that great hope that we have in that, that uh, that we're going to live again right after we die. Now, for those who don't have that hope, well, it, it's, not, it's not so hopeful, right? And in fact, the Bible says that we have this great hope in 1 Peter 1, 3, according to his abundant mercy, uh, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So this hope is more than just, I hope I win the lottery, right? This is a living hope. It's a fact, right? That Jesus rose from the dead. He conquered the grave. And, you know, we talked about 
there's more written about Jesus's rising from the dead than any other event in the history of mankind, and there's so much factual evidence. And so it is not just like, well, I hope so, but this is a, we know it to be sure, right? And so in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, he says, death is swallowed up in victory, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus gives us victory over death, and when these physical bodies die, then we live on. Our spirit lives on. We know that the Bible says we're a triune being, body, soul, and spirit. And so physically, when we die, that's not the end, right? That your spirit lives on. And all of you have probably heard of people who've written books about dying and being dead for an hour or two, and then they you know, went somewhere and came back and, and talk about what it was like. But, but we know the Apostle Paul uh, talked about those sort of things. And so we don't have to live in the fear of death. And that's such a great thing. You know, during the COVID craze, um, I was watching the news every day back then, and you turn on the TV, it's like, we're all going to die. <laughs> it's just like, ah, right? Because, uh, you know, they came out originally like the first few months, and they're like, you know, how many people on the earth? There's like six billion, like four billion are going to die. You know, it's just like, ah. And, 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 but for me, as a believer, I had hope. So my wife and I talked about it. What if you get it? And what if you die? Well, then I got it. And then I didn't die. She's like, ah, oh, you didn't die. <laughs> so uh, she didn't say that, but, right? But, but the reality is, is that you just see life so differently, right? And, and you don't, you don't uh, have to fear. And God doesn't want us to live in fear. And I do think that in our society uh, that organizations who market things use fear to manipulate people. And so Jesus came for us to not have to live in fear. And so he says, Paul says to them in verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Now, Paul is saying, those who sleep, and he's speaking about those who died in Christ, Christians who've died, right? Uh, but he says that those who have died in Christ before Jesus' return will be coming back with Jesus when he comes, right? Because sometimes people read this and like, what is he talking about? He's saying that, that he will bring with him those who died. So what he's saying is if they have died, then they're with the Lord now, and they're going to be coming back with him at this time. And, and we know that the Bible says when you die, you're immediately in heaven with the Lord. There's no soul sleep. There's no reincarnation. It's just straight there. In 2 Corinthians 5, 8, it says, we are confident, yes, well, please rather, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we know that when you die, boom, then you're in the presence of the Lord. So he goes on in verse 15. It says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, the loved ones who have died and gone before us, they are preceding us in their being with the Lord, right? So they died, they're there, they're preceding us, and we will join them one of, those, one of these days, but we will not precede them in being with the Lord, right? And so uh, we're not going to get there and be with Jesus before them. That's what he's saying, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a loud voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet, with the trumpet of God. So when Jesus comes for his church, there will be this shout like an archangel, and it will sound like a trumpet. Uh, and, uh, you know, a trumpet was used in those days to declare an important announcement. They communicated with that. They didn't have cell phones. And, and so in Revelation 1.10, we see this picture. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice. Notice it says, like a trumpet. So it wasn't a trumpet, uh, which said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. So Jesus was speaking to John. And he said it sounded like a trumpet. Now, I don't know if you ever had a trumpet player in your family. Now, I used to play in a band with a trumpet player, and that thing is loud. I mean, if he's standing next to you, it's almost as bad as the real drums. You know, there's like, <sighs> but so it's, it's loud, it's powerful. So this picture of his voice being loud and powerful. And then in Revelation 4.1, it says, after these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And, and the first voice, which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place in the future. So John speaks about this voice speaking to him, and it sounded like a trumpet. And so when Jesus comes with a shout like a trumpet, he's probably going to be saying, come up, right? Church, come up here. And so we're waiting for Revelation 4.1 to take place. Now, in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, the word church appears nine times. And from Revelation 4 on, we do not see that word again. You don't see the word church again. Why? Well, because in Revelation 6, we see that what happens is after the church is taken out, that God's wrath 
is going to be poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. Why do I think that the seven-year tribulation is God's wrath? Well, because in Revelation 6, 17, it says, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Now, that's just what it says, right? I mean, that's what's coming, the tribulation. Now, people know this is coming, right? Uh, from time to time, uh, you know, I watch a prepper show because I'm kind of intrigued at what they're doing there, but people know something's coming, right? And uh, whether it's the preppers or whether it's the religious people storing up stuff in their garage or whatever, but we are waiting for Revelation 4, verse 1 to take place. Now, and that's what Paul's talking about those in Thessalonica in verse 17 when he says, then we who are alive <clears throat> and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. So this is not speaking of the second coming of Jesus. Well, how do we know that? Well, because we're going to meet him in the air. Now, this is what's known as the rapture in the church. And so uh, there are those who ignorantly would say, well, Pastor Bob, don't you know that the word rapture is not in the Bible? And I would say, well, is it? <laughs> Verse 17, when it says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, the word caught up there is a translation. Most of you know, right, that uh, the, the Bible wasn't written in English, right? I mean, uh, we know that uh, this word caught up, it, it comes from a Greek word, a Greek translation, and the Greek word is harpazo, and it means caught up. Now, the Greek came from Latin, and the Latin word is raptus. So from this Latin word raptus, we get the word rapture. It's a transliteration from Latin, uh, rap, raptus, right? So we get the word rapture. So here's the thing. If you had a Latin Vulgate Bible this morning, does anybody have a Latin Vulgate? Nobody. <laughs> oh, someone does, yeah. I mean, I have one on my laptop, right? So, uh, but I'm assuming nobody here speaks Greek. So I'm going to show you what it would look like if it were Greek, but all the words are English except for that one word. So 1 Thessalonians 4.17 would say, then we who are alive and remain shall be, and then that word raptus, right? Raptured together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So that's where we get the word rapture. So it is a Latin word, which was translated in the Greek word into caught up. Now in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, he says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible and shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Now, one day Jesus is coming for his church, and we're going to be changed, right? This corrupt body that we lived in is going to be transformed into immortality. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 40, he said, then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, and one will be taken, and the other left. So we know Jesus has talked about this caught up, this rapture, right? In verse 17, when Paul's talking to those there, that they were concerned about what's going to happen after they die, then about Jesus' coming. And so Paul said, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with those in the clouds to meet them, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So after a period of time, after this rapture takes place around seven years or so, uh, then Jesus will come back and reign for a thousand years. Now, we don't know exactly when that's going to happen. And, and over the last 15, 20 years, you know, pretty regularly, people have come up to me and said, Pastor Bob, did you hear so-and-so read a book about, or wrote a book about the day that the rapture is going to happen, right? And, uh, and then they'll say, what do you think about it? And they'll ask me, have you read the book? I said, well, I haven't read the book, but I can tell you he's wrong, <laughs> right? Because we don't know the exact day, but we do know the times and the seasons, because the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 24, 3, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So Jesus was asked by his disciples, how are we going to know when it's the end of this age, the age of the church, right? The age of, of God working and saving people. And Jesus gave them a big list of things. But one of the things he said to him in Matthew 24, 6, he said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars and see that you are not troubled for those things must come to pass but the end is not yet. Now, notice Jesus said there's, at the end of the age, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, but he says, don't be troubled by that because these things must happen, but the end is not yet. And because of lawlessness will abound. Love of many will grow cold. So Jesus said, there's going to be wars, rumors of wars, the love of many is going to go cold, there's going to be lawlessness, all those sort of things. Now, when you look around at our society and you think about what Ameri those of you who are old enough, to think about what America was like in the 80s, right? I mean, everybody knows about the 80s, right? Spandex, big hair, 80s rock bands, Journey, Ozzy, whatever, right? But 
What was America like in the 80s versus now? Because some people think, well, is this really, you know, is, is it really getting more lawless now than it was? Well, yeah, th- there were no cops at the schools in the 80s, right? I mean, you could take guns on planes. I mean, it's just like, you think, were they crazy back then? Well, it was not as crazy as it is now. And in fact, you know, now we, we've come to this place where in America, highly educated, intelligent people think we should defund the police and let the criminals run the city. But here's the thing. We think, well, that's just somewhere else. But it, it is becoming so prolific even here. Just last week, a police officer was shot in Boise. And when you just think, is it becoming more and more lawless in our society? Absolutely. Yes. I remember as a kid being at my grandma's house, and I never watched the news when I was a kid, but I was, she would let me drink coffee and eat cookies, you know, when I was in third grade or something. And I loved going to her house. And then one day, she was like, shh, be quiet. And it was like, someone got murdered in Boise. And it was like, and I, I asked my grandma, like, was this a big deal? It's like, this never happens. You know, it's like, yeah, it, you know, when I was a kid, that didn't happen. And so we do see lawlessness. And you know, it's why people are moving here. Jesus said, look, this is how it's going to be. Now, in your mind, if you think that's increasing over the last 30, 40 years, well, then that, that's what the Bible says is going to happen, right? Now, in your mind, if you believe that the Christian church is evangelizing the world, and through our powerful witness, we're making the world a better place, and we're going to make the world pure and holy so that Jesus can return to a pure world that's transformed by the power of the church. Now, who believes that? I mean, there are people who believe that, but right, that's not what Jesus said is going to happen. Now, he said there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, and he said, don't let your heart be troubled. So when you turn on the news and you read about Ukraine and Russia, and our government's going to give billions of dollars to Ukraine to fight against Russia, and they're talking about World War III, don't let your heart be troubled, right? Don't think, ah, do I need to get some iodine pills? No, I, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> anyway, we don't want to get off on that, but... <laughs> Uh, but you think about Ukraine, Russia, that's a big deal. And then now Israel, Hamas, right? The world is very crazy, and it's getting crazier by the minute. Now, what does the Bible say about that? Well, the Bible says that's how it's going to be, right? So when people come up to me and say, Pastor Bob, what about Iran and World War III? And I'm like, yeah, that's what Jesus said was going to happen. You're like, what? That's what Jesus said is going to happen? That's exactly what he said. It's going to be crazy, lawlessness, right? Now, <clears throat> it's why it's so good to live here. I mean, every day I'm so thankful to live in Normalville, right? Because You know, I've lived other places around the world. And through your relationship with Jesus, you don't need to worry about the future. And you don't need to be hopeless about the future. And and that's another epidemic in our country. Because of lawlessness, because of world wars, and because of, you know, all the craziness going on, people are anxious and worried, and people are hopeless. I mean, for young people, they're like, what is my future? You know, uh, I don't remember, does anybody know what we owe each person now? The national debts and the trillions. And, and, and I thought I read that y'all owe 32 million or something. <laughs> it's just like crazy amounts. And so for people who look to the future and they think, what's the future hold? Well, it's going to get worse. It's like, is this supposed to encourage us? Well, that's what the Bible says. Now, uh, for those who've been redeemed by Jesus Christ, we have great hope in the future. Why is that? Well, because Jesus is coming to take us back, right? In Matthew 24, Jesus said, in verse 42, when they asked him, what's it going to be like? Jesus told them a bunch of things. going to be like the days of Lot. People are going to be doing evil things. But Jesus said, watch, therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. So no one knows, right? So if someone writes a book next week about the day it's going to happen, you're going to know it's, it's not that day, right? Uh, the Bible says no one knows the day or the hour. Uh, but what we can know, and the Bible says we should know, is we should know the signs of the times. We should know what's going on. We know that Israel was reborn as a nation, you know, that, that Israel was wiped out in 70 AD, and, and then almost 2,000 years later, exactly as the Bible said, the Israel, nation of Israel come back together, and then the Bible says, we talked about the Magog invasion, and all these nations, Iran and Russia, they're going to come against Israel, and this Magog invasion, we know that's all coming. And so when I watch the news, I'm like, it's right on schedule. That's what I think about it. Now, what should we be doing? Now, there are some Christians who think, should we all go get as many credit cards as they'll allow and we rack them up and, you know, get in debt up to our eyeballs and so that when the rapture happens, then we just leave all this debt to somebody else? No, that's not what we're supposed to do. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 44, he said, therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect, right? So he's saying, be ready. Now, what does that mean, be ready? Well, you need to ask yourself, am I ready? If, if Jesus was going to come for the church this afternoon, right while you're playing mini golf at Wahoos, are you ready? 
right? And that's what's important to know. And Jesus wants us to live in a state of readiness for his return. And the purpose of the seven-year tribulation is God pouring out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. And so what we want to be doing is recognizing that God's wrath is coming, and everybody knows it. The preppers know it. Everybody knows it's coming. Revelation 6, 17, for the great day of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand? And here's the thing. You don't want to be here. And what should we be doing? Well, we should be helping people get ready, right? As a church, we want to preach the good news. We want as many people to go with us as possible, right? We don't want any of our family and friends to be here. You know, we've had people come to the church and give me a little box, and it's called a rapture box or whatever. And I'm like, what's this? Like, put it in your lobby so when the rapture happens, and then when, when the people come into the church and like, what happened? They can open it, and it explains to them what happens. I'm like, eh, I don't know if they're going to be coming to the church after that happens, but uh, I'm not sure. But here's the good news. God doesn't want you to go through the seven-year tribulation period, right? And, and he wants you to have a hope for the future. He doesn't want you to be sad and depressed and bummed out about the future. Oh, no, you know, everything's terrible. Uh, I remember when my wife and I first got married, she said, well, do you think we should have kids? Because, you know, what if the rapture happens? And, and, and I said, well, look, Jesus said, occupy until I come. What does that mean? It means be about the Father's business. We need to be doing what God's supposed to do. You need to be working hard at work, at home, taking care of things that you need to take care of. You know, managing your money wisely, not being in debt, doing the wise things, all those sort of things, and being a witness and being a light in this world so that we can bring other people into the kingdom. You know, last Sunday night, we had a baptism, and I think 32 people got saved. So exciting. Well, they got baptized. Yeah, it was exciting. And, you know, many of them just accepted the Lord in, just in the last few months. You know, I always ask them, so when do you accept Jesus? And someone will look at me like, what are you talking about? And, uh, and. You know, I'm like, you know, when you invite Jesus, I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, like two months ago. Where at? Oh, here at church. And, and uh, you know, one lady I talked to, I said, so when did you accept Jesus? She said, like, four months ago. And, and, you know, I don't know why I said this. I don't usually say this. But I said, so how's it going? You know, well, I said, did you go, grow up going to church? Nope. She said she didn't grow up going to church. And she said, uh, it's going great. I'm reading my Bible every day, and it's changing my life. And I was like, that's so exciting, right? And the Lord wants us to Bring as many people as we can, right? And he wants us to look to the future as a great opportunity to be a light and to share it with as many people as we can, right? And that's why we have church every Wednesday, every Saturday, two times on Sunday, right? Because we want to have opportunity for you to bring your friends to church and they can get saved. Now, there are people who might say, well, Pastor Bob, we just don't think you know the Bible very well. We know you've read it through hundreds of times. You've taught through the whole thing verse by verse, but we think we know more than you do. And we think that the church is going through the seven-year tribulation period. And, and then why do you think, Pastor Bob, that we're not going to go through it? Well, this verse right here in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, tell me what you think this means. For God did not appoint us to wrath, he's talking to the church, right, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, and when we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Now notice verse 11, therefore comfort one another and edify one another just as you also are doing. Now, does that comfort your heart when I say that you're not going through the seven-year tribulation period? Answer, yes. Now, what if this whole sermon this morning was, you're going to go through the tribulation. <laughs> you need to get iodine pills because, you know, it saves your liver if you're in a nuclear blast, right? It's just, uh, isn't that comforting? Not to me, it's not, right? But here's the thing. It comforts our heart that the future for us is about being about our Father's business, about loving people, telling people about Jesus, right? Telling people that he loves them. He wants them to be saved, wants them to experience his grace, wants them to have hope for the future, doesn't want them to live in fear, doesn't want them to be lonely, doesn't want them to be sad and worry about everything, but to know that Jesus said, look, the world's going to be crazy, but don't worry, don't fear. I, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help you through it. And so it's important that you know you're ready. And there's no doubt uh, in my mind, I'm ready. I'm ready to go, right? Because, you know, I've received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Now, it's important that you know. Now, maybe some of you are here today and you're thinking, well, what if I'm not sure? Well, the Bible says that God wants you to know for sure. In 1 John 5, 13, it says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And here's the question for you this morning. Do you know for sure that you have eternal life, right? If you get in a wreck on the way home from church today and die, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Now, I know for sure, right? And, and, and you need to know for sure. And you can make sure. How? Well, the Bible says, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, believe that he died and rose again and conquered death, that he can give you the hope of eternal life. So if you've not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we want to give you an opportunity to do it this morning. 
So let's bow our heads, and I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And if you are not sure where you're at in your relationship with Jesus, look, he loves you. And all you have to do is say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life, and, and you can receive him as your Savior, and you can have that hope to know. So uh, let's bow our heads, and, and if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning, then you can just repeat after me. And uh, believers, you can pray with us. So uh, repeat after me if you want to receive Jesus as your Savior this morning. Dear Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I invite you into my life. Fill me with your spirit and help me to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.